Good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today and joining us. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm a marketing communication specialist with SIFT. Uh, for those who are not familiar with SIFT, SIFT is an MEP partner with the Ohio Manufacturing Extension Program, our partnership, who is part of the nationwide public-private partnership with stunners in all 50 states and Puerto Rico dedicated to serving small and medium-sized manufacturers. SIFT is one of the six affiliates in the state of Ohio. Our vision is to be a partner with solutions and innovations for food manufacturing and agribusinesses. We work to achieve this vision through the unique blend of direct services, a membership consortium made up of leading companies in the food space and visual networks of resources and other partnerships. Our goal is to increase competitiveness and growth in Northwest Ohio and throughout the state. We'd like to give a special thank you to Bridget for speaking with us today. Bridget is going on her 11th year at Herzl Canning and Farms working in sales and purchasing. Over her time with Herzl, she quickly fell in love with organic farming and the growers in her community. Her responsibilities shifted into reaching out and providing organic and conventional growers with cover, cover crops, compost, and markets for their crops. This includes soil health studies with Herzl's compost and cover crops with Ohio State and private consultants. Her presentation will cover Herzl compost facility and their uses of compost, the green cleaning facility, and their organic farm and rotation with the use of cover crops. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to hold them to the end. And when you're online, just go ahead to the question and answer session and we will read those out at the end of the session. Uh, at this time, everyone, would you please uh, welcome Bridget. There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, good morning. I'm Bridget from Herzl Farms. Um, I, as um, Adam was saying, I've been with Herzl for almost 11 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I started there as a part-time position and that lasted about two weeks and ended up full-time um, to not have an agriculture background at all. But um, once you um, learn about agriculture and into farming and um, what this company represents and everything. It was a quick decision for me to um, make sure that I did what I could to help this uh, company continue to grow um, in the farming community. Um, I do wanna say a lot of people don't know that we have 1500 acres certified organic. A lot of people just think of us as the tomato farmers. Um, but we also have composting facility and we also have a grain cleaning facility and a food grade uh, processing facility that is certified organic as well. So uh, this presentation, I always put Beyond Tomatoes be yep. because um, you think of herbals, you think of tomatoes. That's okay. Oh, this presentation is Beyond Tomatoes, so I can introduce everybody else to what goes on at Herzl Farms. Okay, um, so we are one of many growers for De Fratelli. Um, we uh, have, I think, close to 30 growers all together um, in the three packing facilities that we have in Ottawa, Pemberville, and uh, Northwood, Ohio. Um, so family obviously is big to uh, Herzl Canning Company and Farms. Um, they're going into their fifth generation of, uh, of the Herzls that are taking over um, the canning facilities and then also the farm. 100 years this year um, that we're celebrating. Farm's actually a little older than that, but uh, the canning facility is 100 years old. 
Um, we do uh, parallel production of non-GMO crops and organic crops on our side of the farm. Um, we supply seed um, as well uh, for non-GMO and organic farmers. Um, so we've been kind of uh, organic for over 50 years. You couldn't be certified until the 90s, but we are actually practicing um, organic farming. Um, well before then, um, John Herzl, um, he was the president um, and then he passed away in 2000 and um, his philosophies um, and his uh, love for um, environmental stewardship and everything that was very important were continuing at the farm. Um, so uh, my boss is president of uh, the farm is Lou Cosmo Jr. Um, he uh, has been at the farm since, I guess, um, high school kind of, but um, then he graduated from Ohio State and then he came back to look after the farm when Tom became ill. So um, most of our employees there at the farm are uh, have been there at least 10 years or longer. Some have been there close to 40 years. Um, some of the crops that we have um, being certified organic and in the rotation, um, it has to be a four-year rotation at least, and then using cover crops as well. So we do corn, uh, sunflowers, some of you have seen sunflower fields around um, here, uh, food grade soybeans, meaning that they go to be crushed for either um, human consumption for oil or um, for tofu. Um, we've just recently, the last three years, um, have been doing edamame as well, which is basically a soybean, so it fits in that rotation, but it is um, harvested earlier. Um, it's the same as what you'd see like in an Asian restaurant um, that gets sent out to Arkansas, but it's grown organically here. Um, we do a variety of different small grains uh, for milling, um, and those as well go all over the country. Um, einkorn, renan, some specialty crops. Um, being organic, um, well, cover crop is important in all agriculture, but in farming, but um, being organic, it's, it's very vital for weed suppression and to supply nutrients to the crops because we don't use any fertilizers or um, pesticides or herbicides. So we use cover crops uh, for that. So um, like all our small grains are under seeded in the spring they're planted in the fall, um, under seed in the spring with clover um, to provide uh, nutrients for that crop and to suppress weeds. Um, the corn and sunflowers will have um, cereal rye. Um, we either uh, put it on if we can get the crops off early enough. If we can't, then we have it actually flown over um, to make sure that they're on. Um, so grain conditioning, seed cleaning, and food grade. So um, our facility is FDA registered um, there at the shop on Bradner Road. We clean um, our own uh, crops for food grade and also other growers. Um, gives them another avenue to market their crops. Um, if they're clean, they're able to, uh, from weed seed and um, maybe splits or uh, deformities or something, they're able, we're able to get a purity on that and hit a spec that they're able to move um, for better markets and get a little bit of a premium um, with us being able to um, provide that service for them. We're, we do um, also package in 50 pound bags. We have a bagger or we can do bulk or we can do totes. Um, we have two optical eyes as well um, that uh, can sort out color or um, sort out um, imperfects um, and different impurities. Um, it's very important whether you're doing for seed or for food grade to make sure everything is sized correctly if you're doing it for food grade so the protein content is um, is uh, steady throughout the process and then for seed you want it all the same size when you're planting. So uh, the top part is like what, uh, this is, um, I think, um, wheat. So we clean the small sorts um, away from the, the nicer um, looking seed. 
Uh, that way, when you're planting, it's all even and it's all the same and you don't have to worry about germ or anything with broken seed. And then the sword outs, actually, we move for feed. Um, it's certified organic as well. Um, so it, anywhere from the backyard growers to um, the big scale feed companies um, is, is who will take something like that for the small sort. You do have a little bit of weed seed in it, but um, when it gets combined with, with the other um, stuff in the bin, um, then it comes irrelevant. So um, I think most of you here probably for, know about the compost facility. Um, so we, we have organic compost, um, a class two facility that is located on 105, um, just outside of Pemberville. Um, we have sunflowers there last year. If any of you guys are around that area, you've probably seen the big field of sunflowers over there. Um, so the compost facility uh, started in 92. Um, that way canning had somewhere to go with, with the tomato waste um, and the cabbage waste. Um, again, John being, um, it was very important for him to um, take care of and look after um, the ways of the waste and environment and um, being organic, you have to find ways to um, give um, to your ground, to take care of your ground. So, um, we do have a laboratory on site there, um, and OERDC has a weather station there, so we're able to monitor some, um, some different types of things to help us make the compost uh, to where we're able to move it and people are able to use it. Um, we are class two facility, class two meaning we can take in food waste, manures, and yard waste. Um, there's classes one through four, one year sewage sludge, and then everything else. Class three, your uh, manures and yard waste, and class four, you're just yard waste and grass. Um, we're about 160 acres total. Um, the Where the compost facility is, is right here in the middle. Um, these windrows here, all the other farms that are around it was what we farm organically. We have crops all around there. Um, we contain everything, all the composting and everything, and the leach state application is all um, contained within our farm. Um, we are licensed to take in up to 100 ton a day um, with EPA. Uh, we take in about 60 to 70 ton right now, but we keep that open in case um, with, the, the, with the movement of going to uh, landfill diversion, we keep that open. Um, that way people can have the choice to divert um, their waste. Um, this is a nice pile of some compost there that's um, cooking away. You can see kind of the corn fodder and different um, things that we're composting through there. So I'm pretty sure everybody here knows kind of what composting is and people online. Um, it's just something that naturally occurs even if if, if we're not um, accelerating along like we do at our facility, um, tree falls in the woods, it, nobody helps it to compost away, microbes just take care of it and compost it away. So what we're trying to do is just accelerate that, um, that process a little bit with turning and mixing and a certain carbon and nitrogen ratio. Um, so the carbon that we have here usually is, um, like sawdust or um, from horse farms that had used sawdust as bedding um, and the manures that are mixed in. Um, we don't do grass clippings, but a lot of people will use grass clippings um, because of us being certified organic. Um, we don't wanna take the risk of the fertilizers and the herbicides and everything that are on the grass clippings. So um, we decline those. Um, leaves, we only do from small towns that are around us, um, again, because of the contamination and then also the trash that comes in with leaf pickup. They're picked up on the side of the street. So there's plastics, there's cans, there's things like that. So we only um, will do like um, Lucky or um, those areas around there, Pemberville. So we do get some cattle manure in from some local uh, cattle uh, guys. They don't have very much cattle. Um, they farm tomatoes for us. We get their manure or uh, dairy that's just outside of BG. We get some pressed manure from them as well. Um, and then our food waste. So uh, we get food waste from um, our own cannery um, in Northwood and some in Pemberville. And then um, 
uh, Hartung is another place that will, um, they're in BG, so we get their cucumber waste. Um, and then uh, some cabbage waste sometimes from Fremont Company, um, depends. And then there's a couple places um, in Seneca and Hancock County that also send us their uh, food waste. Been doing that for a while. Um, two methods of composting. So there's aerobic, which means you, you, know, you have oxygen there. And then there's anaerobic, um, which is what produces like methane and, and they don't mix it, they don't move it, they don't do anything. It just sits in a pile basically. Um, benefits of composting. So we, uh, diversion of the waste, uh, you know, from the landfill, obviously, um, it increases your, as, you know, your organic matter and your soil. Um, environmental stewardship, like I said, and um, compost is good for disease prevention and pest control when you're using it on your ground. Um, the biggest thing for us is to make sure that um, we are trying to have as little waste as possible in our processing facilities. Um, just a few numbers, people like numbers, so I stuck the slide in here. Um, in 2022, um, our own canning facilities were 3,100 tons of tomato and 1,500 tons of cabbage waste um, that came out to um, the compost facility. Um, not just because I work there, but they, they do a lot of innovation to make sure they don't have a lot of waste at um, the canning facilities. They'll put in different machines, um, different things to try to not have waste, but you know, sometimes the crop just doesn't make spec and you, when you're peeling or, or processing, you just have more waste. Um, the cabbage as well for our sauerkraut, people probably know that we have sauerkraut. There was sauerkraut before tomatoes um, actually. So um, the waste, the cores and the outer leaves from the sauerkraut actually comes out to the facility as well. You can imagine what the facility smells like in the first week of August with, with the crowd out there, but uh, Mike, our uh, operator out there does a nice job of covering it up real quick so we don't get any complaints from, from the town. Um, Hartung, like I said, they brought in 1,200 uh, 1, ton of cucumbers last year. Again, they do a nice job. They put in some kind of dicer so they didn't have as much waste coming out. Um, that used to be double and sometimes triple. Um, so they've done a nice job of, of uh, slowing down their waste stream. Uh, G2 Revolution, which is coffee, uh, coffee grounds. So it's the K cups. And what they do is um, they have a machine that separates the actual coffee grounds from the K cups and it shakes it out. And then we get the coffee grounds and they, send um, the K-cups off to be uh, compressed into pallets, actually. Um, there's a little more to that if anybody has in, wants information on that, um, how they collect those K-cups from offices and everything, I can give them contact information for that. And then we have some bakery waste. Um, we call it onion liquid. So the fried onions and vegetables that are frozen, we get the waste from that. Uh, Mondelez or Nabisco that was down there on the river, we get um, waste from that. Uh, carbon, so that's our main thing we get in. We don't pay for any of this carbon, um, thankfully, uh, with what we have um, agreements with some of the farms and stuff around here. Um, we're able to uh, have enough carbon to be able to process all this food waste because the ratio is huge, three to one, 45 to one or whatever. Um, it is to begin with. And then, so there's about 12,000 ton total that diverted from the landfill. I spend a lot of time on that because it's not very easy for these companies to, to make an effort like that. We, we do our best for it. Our tipping fee is, is intentionally lower than what it would be at a landfill. So we try to, we, we try to make it easy for, for these companies to, um, to bring it in because it's not easy for us to do it, but um, we'll make a way. So this is how tomato slop comes in. Um, we make a little corral with some uh, uh, bales of hay or straw or whatever maybe that is that, and then um, have kind of like a little brim here. <laughs> and then we, they, uh, this is a washout pad up here and NAT2 hauls our tomato slop for the Northwood factory. And they come back here, literally swing the gate open and dump the slop. 
normally uh, between, I would say the third week of August and the second week of October, you're about five or six of those trucks a day. So they're, they're hopping pretty quick. This is the, what some cabbage looks like on these wind rows. We apply, um, I keep saying we, but it's Mike. He applies with a uh, side slinger um, spreader. Uh, if you don't get this waste on here evenly, then the compost won't compost evenly. You'll get compaction, it's not as porous, so you'll get hot, cold spots all throughout the windrow. So putting this on evenly before you're mixing it is a big deal, especially cabbage, 90 some percent water. Um, you can stop the compost or slow down the composting process real quick. If you don't pay attention to that um, mixing. So we have a Comtech mixer um, here. Actually got it on a matching grant with ODNR back in 2009 or 10. Um, this is what we're using to turn our uh, windrows with. Um, great machine, uh, just expensive to fix when it breaks down. Um, again, the composting process. So you see what, what's happening with the windrows. Um, that's what we are doing is windrow comp composting. And that's what this little shape is. Um, so the center there is what's hot. When I say hot, um, if you have the right ratios, the carbon to nitrogen, you're 160 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Try to keep that. And that's even in the dead of winter. We do compost in the middle of winter as well. Um, we try to keep that uh, warm and that process um, for about six weeks. And so it'll go up and down, up and down for about six weeks. And then all of a sudden it'll decide that the microbes will be happy and then they start kind of um, slowing down a little bit. And this is what happens. So we have the manure, the food waste is the nitrogen, carbon is this. We're turning it, the oxygen is coming up and the CO2 is coming out. It's Mr. Joel Herzl. So this was at a field day um, and we, he's actually um, reading what the CO2 are, is in this compost pile. I don't remember where this was. This isn't at ours, but this is another place. But again, just seeing how hands-on everybody is there. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, each one of the windrows are uh, monitored um, and recorded. Uh, we have to do that for EPA, but um, Mike does a nice job of doing that uh, to make sure that the process is going well. Um, most of the compost that we are producing has already spoken for, whether it's for our own fields or for retail. Um, so if, if something doesn't hit spec or hit temperature for a while, then um, we have to uh, put it aside and get it out of the rotation until we figure out what happened. Um, so this is something that Mike would do um, for these rows here, kind of keeping um, D9, D10. So this is, we have one section at the compost facility that's D. So these were the rows in D. Um, this is the temperature Fahrenheit that he was keeping. And then for the long period of time, January 15th to December 15th. Um, we do send it off for a third party analysis at A&L. Um, we have to do that. Um, for our certification on organic, number one, um, we have to monitor heavy metals. Um, number two, it's just to be sure that there's no pathogens when it's leaving our facility, whether it's used for ag or um, bagged and sold at retail. Um, so a &L does a nice job of um, calling if they have any questions or concerns or anything uh, about our compost. It has to be directly shipped there within 24 hours of pulling the sample. Um, so like when you're doing fecal coliforms or something like that, um, that make sure we get an accurate reading on that. Uh, so you can see we also do, you know, pH is obvious, um, organic matter on a dry basis, we're at 54, um, which is 54%, which is pretty amazing. And that's what, that's what the biggest thing is when you're doing organic is to build up organic farming or gardening or anything, or even conventional is building up the organic matter in the soil. So that's kind of what, um, with the compost between the microbes and organic matter, you're not going to use it as a fertilizer. People like to say it's fertilizer, it's not a fertilizer. Um, you're feeding the soil, not the plant. Um, we do like germination vigor. So this one's 97%. Average height of seedlings controlled. Normally they do cucumbers, I think. 
um, and the compost um, out beat their, um, whatever they were using in their control. And uh, the, st the stability of the compost, very stable. Um, so where our compost moves to is um, our own fields, about 6,400 tons. We have, like I said, uh, 14 to 1600 uh, certified organic or transitioning over. Um, some of those transitioning grounds we're doing like 20 to 25 tons of the acre to give it a boost. The other ones we're sustaining and we're anywhere from five to 15 ton an acre, depending on what soil test says. Um, and in addition with cover crops and crop rotation as well. Um, another 3,300 ton to just some growers around the area, especially last year when fertilizer became kind of short and manure came short. Um, but explaining to some of them <laughs> what compost is gonna do, it's not the same thing as you're throwing nitrogen on your, on your field. So uh, landscaping 190 ton, uh, a lot of places that you wouldn't realize. Um, ball fields and um, universities actually have our compost mixed in with, with what their landscape is. Retail about 300 ton. Um, all of the places that carry our compost in bulk or in bags, um, it's on our website, it's online. Um, I think we're in about 14 different greenhouses and nurseries around this area. Um, donations, so community gardens and, and such like that. Um, we um, always are trying to help um, these guys out, whether um, if we donate the compost or we donate the delivery or um, just um, trying to get these guys further along with what their goals are. Um, so guidelines for being able to use an organic, um, you have to turn it so many times, you have to sustain at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit, but in organic, we want to do higher. There's a lot of weed seed and tomato seeds. You can't kill tomato seeds very easy. They're very hardy. So we get it up there a little higher than that. They're saying that to be the least. Um, and then again, uh, just making sure there's no uh, residuals of any type of chemicals. And, and just to avoid that, we just don't take grass clippings in. So, um, and then there's all different types of guidelines. And if anybody wanted to know um, about for use of organic, like heavy metals, and if anybody wanted to know what those actual perimeters were, um, they're available online. Um, and we also have a link to them on our website. Again, benefits of using the compost, weed suppression, disease control, irrigate less. So, and when I say irrigate less, it's if you have sandy ground, you put compost in it, it'll hold the moisture longer. Um, if you have comp compacted ground, heavy ground, you put compost in, it loosens it up so then you can get your drainage a little better. Um, it, all kinds of beneficial insects, you wouldn't realize what's actually in the compost. There's worms, I mean, and everything. And then obviously microbes, which is the main thing that you, wanna, you want to give um, to your soil. Um, compost application rates, uh, like I said, for farming, we did, uh, it was a seven year study, I think, with Dr. Basil um, quite a few years ago. Um, and we did 20 ton of the acre every four years, 10 ton every two, three to five ton um, just annually. Um, to boost the organic matter, and this is why we do it in our transitional fields, you, you did the 20 ton to the acre. Over four years, it, it sustained. Um, when you did less than that, it increased it, it bumped it up, but it didn't stay there. Um, different use, so we actually did this here um, at the, the greenhouse that's um, hooked up in the back of the kitchen here. Uh, we did some different cabbages and, and we did 0% uh, compost or 50-50 with peat moss mix. Um, this on this side here, tomatoes, one had compost, one didn't start. Um, we stressed these tomatoes out on purpose to, to see how they would bounce back and, and if um, there was any benefits or um, backfires with the compost. Um, again, these were all just stuff that we kind of did ourselves, our own little trials. This was just top dress, there's zero percent on, um, this is a quarter compost, this was a hundred percent compost, so you've seen the difference. They all took off at the same, but um, the issue with just using straight compost is it's not gonna hold water um, and you're gonna have to water constantly. 
So home and garden use, um, you know, vegetable garden is 50% of whatever, how deep you're going into your garden. If you're doing seven inches, um, you'd add three and a half inches of compost and mix with your soil. Um, raised beds, you want to do like a 60 soil, 40% compost blend. Um, flower pots, you're about 70 potting soil, 30% compost. And again, a lot of that has to do with holding water. Um, you, it, when you do water your potted flowers and you have our compost in there uh, mixed in with it, it's going to run out brown. And that's not anything that's harmful or, or pathogens or manure or anything like that. It's just the lignans that are leaving. Um, but keep that in mind if you have them on a real pretty deck or concrete or anything that you're gonna have that brown running out of there. Uh, lawns, um, they actually have it blown on with the seed. Um, if you're doing new lawns, um, if you just want to top dress your lawn with it, you're about a one and a half to two inches just broadcasting it. Just make sure you're whatever you're using it goes evenly. If you get a bunch of compost in one pile, then the grass is going to be super thick on that end. And so uh, just it, it does what it's supposed to do, but just make sure it's even. Um, trees and shrubs, same thing. Uh, you're taking out your hole to put your your shrub in or your tree in. You want to put some compost in the bottom of that, then the tree, and then some more compost, and then the topsoil, and then some compost. So you're kind of layering it in there. Um, when to do it in the spring uh, before you're planting, but make sure you're working it in. And then the fall after you uh, maybe your last harvest and you want to put some cover crops in there or, or not, um, you just want to put the compost on there, just let it set on there till the spring. Even in your gardens, I suggest you use cover crops. I'm sure Vicki here would suggest that too. Um, why our compost? Well, like I said, because we're diverting food waste from the landfill. So, and you're keeping it in the community and um, we've been doing it for a really long time. Um, our practices are certified for organic use. Um, not very many composts are. Um, not just the practices, but the components that are used in. Um, we're monitoring them. each one of the components that we uh, use in our compost, we also do, um, we send off for um, analysis to no carbons and nitrogens. So we're not just guessing when we're making these windrows. Um, no grass clippings and leaves, like I said, that way, um, so no residuals for chemicals. And uh, third party tested pathogens, pesticides, and, and the nutrients. Um, this is what our bags look like. You may or may have not have seen them at uh, your local nursery. Um, we, and then bulk, uh, tea bags. Um, I, we, we only have these in a few different places. This is something that you'd use on your house plants. You'd put it in uh, like two gallons of water and then use it to water your plants. Um, it just sits in there. You don't have to cook, you don't have to do anything. Um, you just get the benefits of the compost in a smaller amount for your house plants. Um, so these are just some tools that I always uh, give to our uh, customers, our growers, like the McGill compost calculator. Oh, excuse me. If you just um, go on there and put in what size your raised beds are or your lawn or anything is, it gives you um, a good um, uh, read back of what, how much compost you're going to need. Um, our website, again, also carries uh, anywhere that our compost is at. And um, um, if you have any questions or anything, you can just reach out to the website. And so, like I mentioned, cover crops before. Um, so this is rye that's in some, some Hoytville clay that's behind the top there. Um, and compost that was incorporated in, uh, beneficial microbes. Um, decaying plant, uh, anything that you're going to be planting into it. Um, so cover crops, we do, uh, we work with Albert Lee Seed, um, another hundred year old company out of Albert Lee, Minnesota. Um, we grow for them and we're also dealers for them, seed dealers for them. And they have something pretty fancy here for different types of cover crops and what they do, when to plant them, rates, um, what you're going to get out of it. So if you know what your goals are, if you're wanting more nitrogen, if you're wanting weed suppression, um, something like that, uh, drought tolerant, you can kind of pick and make your own little mixes up. Um, we do that uh, at our shop as well. Um, 
We did uh, three trials with Ohio State for cover crops. We did on a certified organic field that's been organic since, you know, for 40 years. Um, this is one of the mixes that um, Lou and I made for this specific field. It had heavy thistle pressure in it. Um, it has some spots that are tiled very well. So um, we combined this mix to see um, if, if, if this would help. Um, it did some. And this is just why we did an aerial shot of it. And we um, part of it and let the other part grow. They were doing some biomass here, OSU came out. Um, needless to say that it stunted the thistle, but it, it didn't, didn't suppress it as much as we'd like. Uh, this is a transitional field up by Curtis Road. Um, and we did two separate mixes on this side. So I did basically value, which is the value max mix and the diverse mix. They were similar in price, um, similar in mixes, but I wanted to see if, if bang for your buck was better um, than that. And actually in this case, it, it is. Um, that's what a 14 way mix looks like <laughs> on your on your field, which I know some of the conventional guys would be cringing right now looking at this, but um, it, a lot of diversity um, in that field needs a lot of help. This field here is by the Turnpike off 163, Packer Creek's back here, right here floods like terrible. This is another uh, cover crop mix, but nothing would grow. I mean, the ground's compacted and, and all that stuff. And, it's it's not very good. Um, these are the turnips that came out of Eric's field, which they should be a lot bigger than that, but they weren't. Or not turnips, uh, radish. And then, um, so we put some sorghum sedan grass in there to try to break up that field and then some radish as well. If you wanted more information on cover crops or compost, um, there's mm -hmm. tabs on our website for that as well. And obviously I'm here to contact. So. And I always put this because if, I mean, farming, you know, you try and try and try and you, it just depends if the rains are up. So um, that's about it. Any questions? What the, the is for your there? Yeah, so we don't depackage. Oh, yeah. So the question was Is there any food waste that we have to turn away? And that, what kind of uh, food processors are reaching out? Um, so, what what we do is we, we don't depackage. So, um, if, if there's packaged um, uh, food waste, then we wouldn't take it. Um, if there's bins or where it's stored and it and it's cleaned with detergents, um, we won't take it. Um, again, it's going to kill the microbes and just with our organic certification. Um, I I don't think that um, what's lacking is the people that are wanting to compost. I think it's the transport. So having to um, like you've seen the truck with the tomato waste on it, um, NAT, and there's only a couple others that actually have um, trucks that are able to do that. Um, and, and then it's it's heavy and it's pricey. So um, it's not necessarily turning um, turning away or people not reaching out to um, compost their um, food waste. It's more or less the transport of it. We'd pretty much, um, like I said, we're, we're licensed for that big surge that's coming. We all know that it's coming. Um, it's on the East Coast, it's on the West Coast, and we kind of get smushed in the middle and the Midwest gets it later. Um, and we're prepared for it. Uh, carbon is in line for when that happens and, and, and things like that. But um, it's just um, in our area, they need a little more push to, to do those things, but we're ready for it when it happens. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any microbes or anything that you're adding to the compost to elevate or to end up at a certain goal? Maybe from an appropriate standpoint? So the question was are we adding any uh, bugs in a jug to our compost? Um, no, we do not. Uh, we've had samples and people drop off and, and different, and we took the time and did up to 18 months even. and 
nothing was different. Um, the process took just as long, if not even longer. Uh, and uh, the compost didn't show any difference in microbial activity or didn't break down any quicker or anything like that. Normally they're trying to see if you could speed up the process and that's why they give those to you. And I mean, it's been composting for thousands of years and never needed help. So it knows what it's doing. Yes, Vicki. Do you get a lot of uh, contact or outreach from municipalities? You know, I live in Rossford and I know we have a yards that we take brush and grass clippings. And, and then of course, then they break that down by, you know, chipping it and stuff. And do you have any of those, you know, facilities ask for your help or to supplement in anything and to, you know, kind of generate their own things where they can put it back in their community? So Vicki's question was um, for the people listening online. If uh, the municipalities with the yard waste and brush are reaching out to us to to take some of that, they do. Um, and and there's times where um, I think we charge like ten bucks for them to dump a whole truck there, just because we're going to have to run it through a grinder or something. And um, we but we have to police it because the trash and stuff gets into it. So. Um, normally they'll give us a call, but yeah, and, and that's a possibility if you know of some, we used to get like all of Rossford's leaves, I think it goes to renewed now, I'm not real sure, but, um, uh, <laughs> we, we are, we welcome it, but we do have guidelines for it. Do you, have, do you ever have anybody ask for some of your compost to jumpstart what they already are trying to do themselves no we have not and that would be something they they could do i mean if you take a you know yeah stuff that they got sitting in their yards especially because they've already got the, the compost components right so maybe it's it's they're just sitting there a kind of slow ride and i don't know what they're using to turn things with if it's a front end loader or something that's a big process with that but taking finished compost we we actually uh, Mike does it uh, when we're screening out our finished compost for retail um, the the balls and stuff that come off the bigger parts we use that to start the next pile and it sparks it up pretty quick so but they, yeah they I don't um, I guess to answer your question I I have not had anybody reach out for our uh, finished compost to start their compost of their brush yeah yeah um a lot of times uh they'll they're well like lake erie there's a few other places if they get too much then they give us a call and say hey can we we bring it out um they're under regulations too so and where they're positioned at and their neighborhoods and there's houses and stuff around them and and uh normally when you know when they don't have space or they had a phone call that's when they call us too to take in the rest of it. DJ. You're not losing that much. Is that because you're buying stuff? I mean, you have a lot of green products. You're always looking for brown, am I right? Yes. Yeah. So how much are you losing in that process? It seems like you're not losing that much. Um, we are. We're about a 66% loss when it's all said and done. Um. A lot of the food waste that we receive in is in liquid form, like in a tanker um, that evaporates like right away. So um, we'll put some on the wind rows and some would just land a fly on uh, the fields that are around it. So we have a 28 acre field, I think it's 28 acres, that's right next to the hoop barn at our facility, at our composting facility, that's not certified organic and that's on purpose. So we have a place to go with some of that liquid waste if we need to. And then we have um, a couple conventional guys because we'll throw obviously cover crop still on it and they'll come and they'll bail the clover off of it or something like that. So it still doesn't technically go to waste then, you know. Um, do you think there will be a scramble for brand as we talk about some of these bigger companies and other large people coming in? It's going to be a problem in the future. Um, I mean, carbon is. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry that. Uh, so the question was, do, are we going to see um, a limited supply of carbon in the future? I mean, carbon is always something that you're looking into um, and in forecasting ahead, like, you know, 
uh, way more than what you think you're going to need or you're going to have to stockpile or anything. Um, I think because of us being established already and and doing for how long that we've been doing it, we're on everybody's radar. Um, so we're the we're usually the first one they call uh, for something like that. Um, we're also in a position where we're able to maybe help people that are in a pickle with something. Um, you know, having to move a bunch of manure or something like that. We take trucks in our loader and, and we do it. So um, I think that's what uh, kind of gives us a little bit of an edge of getting the carbon is because we're actually able to go and remove it if we, we need to remove it. So um, the pipeline going through things like that, I mean, it went through a lot of our farm. Um, and what I did was went to them and said, any trees or anything that you're knocking down has to come out to the compost facility. It's not allowed to go to anywhere else. If you're driving 25 miles, that's not my problem. It's coming out to here, it's on our grounds so and that's what you're doing. That put us ahead when that came through. So, and, um, but again, you're always forecasting for that. I don't think there's gonna be as many composting facilities around. Um, I, it's just expensive. They can't keep up with the regulations. I mean, you're looking at an engineer to come in for $40,000 just to tell you to dig a pond right here. And, and not everybody can afford that, you know, when you're first starting up. So um, <laughs> like I said, us and Andre Farms and places like that being, being established, I think, um, and, um, like Joe Herzl and them seeing that forecasted way ahead and just being good businessmen and and um, laying that out, I, I don't think we see an issue for that. But I mean, it's definitely something that we are always planning for. Yeah. Uh, what is your recommendation for a farmer that might be today doing a conventional know, little crop or to you want to investigate going on a farm farm? I mean, what's, what's his best avenue? Or so the question was, um, a conventional farmer may be thinking of going organic um, and what ways to do that. So um, when you're going to transition ground, you got to keep in mind that you're not, it's three years. So to transition over, um, you're going to try to find a little premium maybe. Um, with a non-GMO or something or a transition ground, but you're going to have to move in at conventional prices. Um, if you have livestock, maybe do it with alfalfa because that'll help your rotation. Um, and uh, But it's pricey as well. I mean, start small until you can scale up and then, you know, uh, sought out people that are already doing it. For whatever reason, um, you know, like I said, I in the beginning, what, what I love the most about with these organic growers, I mean, they're sharing equipment, they're talking on the phone, they're um, telling everybody what worked and what didn't work. Um, so that, that outreach to somebody that's been organic, somebody like um, us at Herzl, like Lou, or there's a couple other places, I definitely would have them uh, reach out to them first. Also, there are um, a, a lot of um, different uh, workshops that are coming up now for people that are wanting to transition to organic and you pretty much can attend all of them because online um, in there, if you go to like OFA website or something like that, they'll show transitioning workshops um, or even like local. We try to put as much as we can on our social media. Like we know that are things coming up. I think there's three around this area every year. There's one that started last year that was actually out um, at Sauter Village going to be again the beginning of the year in 2024 that's a great one it's a green growers one um, we had a lot of transitional turnout from indiana michigan and ohio last year there's 70 some growers that were transitioning that showed up there so just reaching out i would definitely um before you go ahead uh i definitely would talk to somebody else that's already farming organic okay. markets are really hard you'd think there would be a ton of markets around here because not everybody's organic there's not actually enough organic certified organic acreage to make the demand for 
organic uh, livestock or, or food or anything here, um, but um, markets are a big issue um, with, unfortunately, with us here locally. Um, so once you start transitioning over and then you can um, collaborate with the other growers, maybe you won't have as much, but we take sometimes if we have a grower that maybe only has two, 3,000 bushels or something, then um, if I'm able to get it in to um, somewhere that we're selling our product to, I'll buy it from that grower or combine it with ours and then move it through ours. Um, kind of brokering, but not, it's more, maybe they don't have storage, maybe they don't have, you know, the means to, to get it somewhere. So we'll try to take that on and help that person get through. Um, like I said, if you go to the OFA website, OSU extension, the Wooster extension, they're always having something on there about um, organic field days, um, social media, just just get involved and, and make those connections first, I would say, before you even decide. I mean, because you won't realize like how much equipment and everything, it's, it's totally, and why, why are you going organic? You know, if you're going organic because you think you're going to make three times money, you do convention, just forget it. Just stay farming what you're farming. But if you have a reason and you want, you know, you want to cut back on your inputs and you want to, you know, um, just kind of get back to the land a little bit and um, then, you know, definitely go forward and making those connections. Yeah. When, since you've been in the compost business a long time, are they looking at the final amount of like the microbes and the fungi and the things that are in there, like with some of the DNA sequencing? And that, is that something that you're starting to get a better understanding of what's actually there and how to use it? Um, so the question is, what um, are we trying to track, um, like microbial activity and our compost and um, parameters and such. And yeah, actually, it's a great question. We are. Um, we're with a private lab right now. Um, and uh, her name is Wendy Zellner. She's um, actually uh, starting to look at that sequencing and colonization um, and, and getting those numbers that we're looking at. Um, she just picked up samples, actually, I think about a month ago. And she's starting on that. We do that with OSU as well. So um, one of our um, extension, uh, people, well, Cassie Brown, and she as well, we're going to do a variable rate study of compost on transitional ground. Um, on the one Eric field that I had up there that I said floods in the back by Packer Creek and all that. So we're gonna do variable rates on that and picking up, she just picked up samples and stuff yesterday. Um, she's going to work with Fred Michelle, Dr. Fred Michelle at OSU. Um, he's uh, runs their composting place over there, and we're, they're actually going to be measuring that and and how it's reacting in the soil and what's present in the soil, and then we put compost in the soil and and trying to get a count because that's the biggest thing. You don't get counts on these; there are just so many of them. Um, but you can at least monitor like colonization of them and and so so. Yeah. The question could take post consumer food waste, but some restaurants seem to think that you don't. If you think that the volume in a given area would ever warrant, you know, the businesses that think they can do something with the post consumer. Okay, so the question was with post consumer food waste, um, and if we would be able to take it, we we would, um, and and we, but again, it's just the transport. But I think they're like Go Zero, um, David Andre. So he's trying to um, infiltrate that a little bit with his smaller containers, and and then the the restaurants and the businesses are trying to work together. So they only have one fee when he comes and picks it up, and, and things like that. But um, it's not that we don't take it. It's it's um, we would, you know, we don't take like. A, blood, bone, and feathers or anything like that out there, um, but uh, just because of the disease that it can carry, but we, um, but we would definitely take like restaurants, like BGSU, I, I didn't have them on there, probably should have, like their dining halls, they're both their dining halls, like we get their food waste from, from their prep, 
so of like their salad bars and stuff. And they actually do a really nice job. Um, Nick Hennessy, I think is still there. Um, but he, he came out, I think in maybe 2014. So yeah, we've been doing it in a while, 2015 maybe. And he came out to the compost, talked about what he wanted to do. And our main thing was, okay, you got college because we can't have plastic forks. We can't have cans. We can't have, you know, and plus, you know, those kids graduate and move on and the next set may, might not be as passionate about something. They've done an excellent job. Um, I would suggest anybody that is working in a school or a university or a restaurant or anything to see how they do it, that they, they would be an excellent resource for that. So that's BG Labor and NAT Transport. It's BGSU. Yeah. Oh, NAT Transport's it. Um, but it's it's somebody policing it in there, like I said, because you have that many students and you're not getting, literally, we're not getting one plastic fork in, inside of there or a can. You have yeah. a question in the back? Yeah. Uh, is there an ideal environment post to promote microbial? Um, and they keep control of the environment. Um, what would you prefer to say to promote microbial growth? Um, I guess uh, I could answer that a couple different ways. Um, so the question was the control environment. Is there a better way to compost and control a more controlled environment? Um, so one of the biggest things with composting um, is turning it. So we used to start our windrows on um, like a field, like a ground that has just dirt, you know what I mean, or whatever. And um, if, if it was too wet or rainy and then food waste being sloppy, sometimes we couldn't get out there to turn it. Um, so we had to, you know, it took longer for that process to happen. Um, we, we continually keep carbon and nitrogen ratios the same. Um, and that's on purpose. So they're kind of finishing the same. Um, if we were controlling the components in that are going into, um, we might have a little higher nitrogen in one um, than another. It's mostly because it's what type of carbon are we putting in there? Is it pressed dairy manure? Is it wood chips? Is it something like that? So if you're controlling the components that are going in, you're kind of con controlling the process and, and the environment that it's composting in. But I mean, we're, we're composting all winter. We have an asphalt pad now that um, we compost on and that's typically, so we're able to turn it when we can turn it. We're able to move it when we wanna move it. Um, it's it's not sitting there because compost does its job. So, you know, it, the windrow is out there in the field and you're trying, and it, might be a dry day or a dry week or whatever, and you're going out to turn it, and that compost is breaking out down the field that's underneath it because it's doing what it's supposed to do. So the, the mixer or something or the turner or the side row slinger or whatever you're trying, equipment you're trying to move around it, it's sinking in, it's not moving as much because like it's the compost is, is, is trying to work that ground that it's actually on. Um, we, there are a different, um, there are different types of composting that they do in vessels, like in vessel composting. Um, I think the, the one in Napoleon there, um, the H4 or whatever it was called, they tried to say that they could get it to the thermophilic stage in like 24 hours or something like that. And it had a bunch of these solids that came out. Well, we tried to compost the solids for, I, I think it, was maybe four years and it still, it was like 120 degree. There's no way that that you can control something like that. So, um, you know, like I said, it's been doing it for thousands of years and it kind of knows what it's doing. So we, if, if you try to, you can, you can accelerate the process of it, but you have to keep those microbes happy first. I mean, if you don't, you know, they need, they need moisture, they need oxygen, they need these, these things, they need the carbon to sit on, you know, like a reef and it sits on there and it waits for, waits for its, um, its reaction there. So um, if you're composting in your backyard or something, um, you know, you can control it in your little tumbler if you're using a tumbler or something like that, but it takes a long time. And one of the biggest things is people don't realize how, especially when you're doing food waste, I mean, it's water. <laughs> I mean, it's sloppy, it's messy, it smells. I mean, you, you don't want to ever discourage anybody from composting, but you want to make sure that everybody's aware of, 
of what they're getting into before they do it and they're just prepared. Have there been any people who want to research or just kind of come out and look at the data? Or the classroom or the slides? Have anybody wanted to kind of come out so the question was, does anybody come out and want to kind of study on the different insects or whatever that's going to be with the composting? Um, not really. Um, we haven't had any anybody wanting to do any, any um, to look at what kind of insects or anything that are on there when it's processing. DJ? Product that you're raising on the compost is more nutrient than conventional. Um, so, you know that we're getting more nutrient from Um, so the question was, um, with organic. Farming with the use of compost versus conventional if there's more nutrient dense crop or product after. Okay, so um, Dr. Basil did, um, this was a while ago because he's passed away since, but, um, and there's also um, just for organic farming in general, that isn't even with compost, uh, there are some nutrient density studies going on. Um, they've done it with small grains, they did it with uh, hard red wheat, I think, and um, Theorem, maybe, and they did it organically, and there was a significant difference in nutrient density of the organic grown to the conventional. Um, those are private funded labs because uh, normally, um, because USDA will only do a limited study of those types of, of things. So. But I mean, if you taste a tomato that's out of your garden and you had compost in it versus something, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, that's the biggest thing is taste, right? So if it tastes good and then people worry about whether it's good for them or not later, but um, normally, right? <laughs> so, but for organic, you know, it's, it, you have to work with the soil for it to be organic. I say you are what your soil eats, right? Because whether it's livestock or whether it's, something they're planting in there and you're going to consume it later, right? It's taking what's in that soil up first and eating that. So then you're consuming that. <laughs> so you got to kind of be mindful. It's all synthetics there then. And in no way am I shaming conventional farming, by the way, obviously. It's just, um, you know, anybody that's growing food to feed people is as amazing as it is. So. Okay. Thank you so much for Bridget and Herzl coming out today and speaking to everybody. And thank everyone for attending and thank you to our sponsors for supporting us. Um, appreciate everybody coming out. The next Agribusiness Forum will be on July 15th. We'll be featuring Barry McGraw with Air, Arable Research Labs presenting on soy-based products developed and commercialization. We look forward to seeing everybody back and uh, we have a nice afternoon and uh, part of the week. Thank you for coming. Thank you again. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.